All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the books of John, the epistles of John, not the gospel of John. So we're getting close to the end of the Bible. Next week is Christmas uh, Sunday, and we'll have our regular morning service, but not a Sunday school hour. And um, then the next week we'll look at Revelation. Next year is our church's 50th year, and you've probably seen on calendars and stuff several things that we are wanting to do to commemorate that. And one of the things that we're going to do is, uh, one of the things we'd like to do, well, we're going to do is to publish an, a year uh, Bible reading plan, and we're going to encourage all of, us, all of you, all of us together, to read the Bible on the schedule uh, of that plan. Uh, one of the things Pastor Dameron would like to just emphasize is that it's uh, not just Hoosier Bible Days in September, but our 50th year is the year of the Bible. Um, of course, every year has been a year of the Bible, but we want to put extra emphasis on that. And so um, the reading plan that, we, that will be on the sheet that we give out on Sunday morning will follow, start in Genesis and just work all the way through. You'll, you won't be surprised once you think about it to know that... Um, It'll take us all the way to September or so before we get to the New Testament. Uh, nearly three-quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament. We'll just work through it. We've tried to uh, arrange it where there's about the same amount of verses to read each day or the same amount of text, but of course some verses are longer than others and all that. But anyway, I say that because uh, this year, purposefully, we've done a survey of the Bible uh, next year, hopefully, as many as you that will, will be reading through the Bible, um, verse by verse, through the Bible, through the, through the year, and my intentions are to each week take a lesson from what you will be reading. Now, if there's just too good of a lesson to, to, to you know, I might take one from one that we just read the week before, but my plan is that each Sunday morning we will look at not the whole week's reading, but a text that you're going to run across through the week and we'll teach from that through this next year. So, and then um, certainly uh, um, all the men here that preach will know about that schedule and they may uh, decide to go ahead and preach from a recently read passage or a soon to be read passage as we go through the Bible next year. Uh, this morning we're looking at John 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Um, most tradition, and most of the time, tradition, there's a reason it's tradition. There's a good amount of truth in there. Sometimes tradition grows things on top of it. That's not true. But most of the time, if something is traditional, uh, there's a reason, and it's mostly, you know, there's a kernel of truth in there, and it might be totally true. Um, and again, sometimes tradition grows so many things on top of it that the truth is you know, lost totally and tradition is not true. But we typically think of these books and the Gospel of John to be written by <clears throat> John, um, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, that John. Uh, we, it's pretty much, it's pretty apparent that 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Gospel of John are all written by the same man, has lots of the same style and refers to himself there, but he doesn't. Um, who is this John? There are a couple Johns in the Bible. Um, there's this one who Jesus loved. Uh, doesn't say that's John, but that's how the Gospel refers to the author. And um, we know that a son of Zebedee, was John. There's here in, you know, 2 John, the elder. Um, and maybe all of those are the same person. But I'm just pointing out that it does, this text, the Bible itself, doesn't say. So we, we're not absolutely, we're certain when the Bible says Paul, that Paul wrote it. Uh, we're not certain when the Bible doesn't say who wrote it. It just says one who Jesus loved or the elder. But it seems like it would be um, the Apostle John. 
Um, John, uh, the Gospel of John, it seems apparent, was written a, a, probably a decent portion of time after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these letters of John, well, these, the epistles of John and 1 John, uh, seem to be written later in um, the time when the, when the books of the Bible were written. And so uh, most of the time we think of these as being written at the end of the first century, which is about the 90s, uh, the 90s. Um, Paul and Peter wrote in the 60s. Paul wrote even in the 50s um, and 60s. John uh, is writing in the 90s A.D., seems like, um, and probably written from Ephesus or maybe these letters were written after John was uh, on the Isle of Patmos, but um, it seems, in, in history tells us that John's ministry moved to Ephesus, obviously sometime after Paul had left there, um, but his ministry is in Ephesus. We have Ephesus being the first um, city that Revelation mentions, and, um, and, and Ephesus was a large city, so there was probably many different churches in that city. Uh, we might call them house churches. Uh, we might, it's probably not really, when we think of house church today, it'd be different when what they were doing back then, but um, churches met in homes. They didn't have like church buildings uh, in, these, in the early days when there was persecution and that type of thing. So anyway, um, so these books are written most likely, first of all, first recipients would be believers that are in churches in Ephesus and the surrounding areas. Um, I want to look at 2nd and 3rd John first. They are actually addressed to someone, and it seems like they give us kind of the setting for all three of the Johns. Um, the first, second John, then, is written. It says, the elder to the elect lady and her children. So it's written to uh, a lady and her children. Some people believe that this is uh, an individual lady and uh, her family that was probably living in the Ephesus area. Others, since the church is called the Bride of Christ, and others believe that this was written to a church, that the author used this symbol of a lady and her children, a church and its members, given some personification here. Either way, um, what it says is, of course, applicable to us. And there's some emphatic words here you can see. It's probably just on one page in your Bible, 13 verses. And the word love occurs four times, and truth occurs five times in these 13 verses. Uh, it seems like this letter was written to warn against heresy and the association with false teachers. So we're getting um, 60 years after the time of Christ, 50 years after the time of Christ. Uh, the gospel has spread around the known world. And even in Paul's day, there was Judaizers, and now 30 years later, there's still people that are false teachers. And John uh, writes here to warn against the false teachers and the false teaching. And he just a quick letter that talks about truth and error. Uh, we have the divine truth in relation to believers. We see that it unites them together. It eternally dwells in them. In connection with love, it characterizes their spirit, and in loving obedience to the truth, it's the path that they walk in. But there's error. There, in verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So they, um, the deceivers are around, and they're trying to deceive those that are in churches. Um, one of the things that these in particular... Uh, hold to is that, um, how's it said there, that Jesus Christ, uh, confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So they, they, there's a Jesus here, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't God, or there's a lot of different ways that you can not confess that Jesus came in the flesh, but they deny the incarnation of Christ, and this must be guarded against, and they depart from the teachings of Christ. Um, these verses... 
um, verse 9, 10, and 11 are very powerful verses. If you um, went to Fairhaven Christian Academy, you memorized these verses. If you didn't, they're good ones to memorize. Verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that bids him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So, um, in one sense, we would say there's nothing wrong with being friendly to people, but uh, people that are preaching a false gospel, we don't say, you know, the Lord bless you and keep you, um, have a great day. We don't want them to have a great day. They're trying to get people to turn away from Christ. They're trying to send people to hell. We don't have to curse and rail against them, even Michael the archangel said to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. You know, we don't have to go um, whatever, but we don't in our, you know, trying to be nice, we, we don't have to be nice to, to false teachers. We don't have to be um, abrasive and, and rude. Just, no, don't come in. I don't want anything to do with you, and I don't wish you success. I wish that you would come to know the truth about Christ. Um, so, um, this, there's peril in fellowship with deceitful deceivers. And then he ends that quickly. He says, I have many things that I could write, but I'd rather see you and speak face to face, that your joy may be full. And so, so that's Second John. So we have this, there's these false teachers going around, and he's encouraged them to walk in the truth. And then Third John is written to Gaius, um, the well-beloved Gaius, and um, <clears throat> he, well, well. so I'll get to it about him in a little bit. Uh, verse 8 says, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. So 3 John is about, um, is about hospitality or about helping those who are preaching the truth. So 2 John is about resisting, basically, or being, being aware, beware of those that are false teachers. And 3 John is about helping those who are true evangelists of the Lord. The subject matter is hospitality, and that would be um, keeping them in your home, uh, speeding them on their way, all of these types of things. And it centers around this um, book, letter, with 14 verses, centers around three people and then these evangelists. First is Gaius, who it's written to, and we don't know exactly, there's, some, there's several Gaiuses, is that how you'd say that, in the Bible, several of them. Uh, there's one spoken of by Paul in Romans 16, it might be this guy, but we don't know for sure. Anyway, it's written to Gaius. What we do know, even though we don't know which Gaius it is, we do know that he's worthy of affection. Uh, John, or John, let's say, says, I love, who, I love in the truth. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prospers. He's a consistent Christian. He's walking in the truth. And he's given to hospitality. He's given to helping um, people. And then there is uh, Diotrephes. And Diotrephes apparently was a leader in the church uh, in the group of believers where Gaius was. And again, it might, there might not have been a, you know, First Baptist Church of Ephesus with, you know, hundreds of believers. There could have been 20 or more churches in Ephesus. And here's this group here where Gaius is and Diotrephes. And Diotrephes is, though, a leader there. He has some uh, authority, but he is ambitious. He's bigoted. Um, here is whoever, you know, here's the Apostle John, let's say, writing to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, receives us not. Okay, so John says he receives us not. Who's John referring to when he says us? Himself and the other apostles who had fellowship with Jesus Christ. And Diotrephes says, I don't, I don't want to have anything with you. Um, he receives us not. Um, 
And then he says, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. So he was, he'd assumed to be a lord over uh, Christ's vineyard, and um, he's going to reap that. Um, he will be judged by this, John says. And then there's Demetrius in verse 12. Um, Demetrius has a good report of all men and of the truth itself. And then there's the evangelists. There's these itinerant spiritual laborers, we might call them. They, we see them in verse 7. Uh, For his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. And we therefore ought to receive such. So he says there's these people going out preaching the gospel. We ought to receive them and help them. But Diotrephes says no, and he, does, he you know, kicks them out and even casts out of their fellowship that they have, this church, people that would just help these other evangelists. Um, so, but they should, be, they should be helped. And finally he closes and tr- says, I trust I shall shortly see you also, and we shall speak face to face. So John wants to talk to them face to face. So then... Go into 1 John. 1 John is not written like a letter is written. Uh, if you think of Paul's epistles, it's, uh, you know, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto this church or whatever. And uh, even 2 John and 3 John are the, the elder to the elect lady or the elder unto Gaius. 1 John is not written in that way. He just starts out almost like the Gospel of John. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So it's almost like John has prepared this in in his mind, and of course under the um, moving along of the Holy Spirit, a message that's important to everybody. Most likely, it was sent to the churches in Ephesus first. But we have it today, so very clearly they copied it and passed it along to another, and copied it and passed it along to another, because when they read it, they received it, as it was in truth, the word of God, not just a word from John. And so this is not written to one group of people. It's written to all of us. And um, it it doesn't have greetings or farewells or anything personal necessarily into it. Um, It does talk to the people, uh, the believers, as little children and beloved. There's uh, four reasons that this um, sermon, we might say, or this letter was written. It was to add to their joy, verse 4 there, which we read. It was to uh, guard them against sin. Uh, These things write unto you that you sin not, chapter 2, verse 1, to warn them against false teachers. And at this, we already saw um, from 2 John and 3 John that the time, at the time when these letters are written, there's false teachers. There's many false teachers. And um, then... To, uh, to strengthen their faith in Christ and assure them of eternal life. These things write unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And so we can see in 1 John, he, he is writing this letter to everybody. He wants to battle um, the false teachers, and he wants to encourage believers in the way that they ought to live. And we'll see that as we continue through it. There's uh, some key words, the, the key word of fellowship, um, Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. Um, and then there's the key word of know and uh, the key word of love. Fellowship, know, and love. Um, so this epistle, we might say, can be called the letter of certainties. These things have I written unto you that may, you may know. The word know is used, um, or, or an equivalent to know, it's over 30 times in this book. And there's seven important things where we know comes. We, uh, we can know 
that a righteous life indicates regeneration. We can know that we will be like Christ at his coming. We can know that Christ came to take away our sins. We can know that brotherly love indicates that we have passed from death unto life. We can know that he abides in us by the witness of the Spirit. We can know that we have eternal life, and we can know that our prayers are answered. So, then, 1 John's introduction, which we read, is very similar to the gospel. It has this uh, very eternal, uh, that which was from the beginning. Remember, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And here he refers to that which was in the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. He's talking about Christ, who had seen and heard and handled and looked upon. Um, we declare unto you, so he's declare, he says, I'm declaring Christ unto you that you may have fellowship with us. He says, we, again, who's he referring to? Himself and the other apostles. We had fellowship with Christ. We had fellowship with God, and we, I'm declaring him unto you so that your fellowship could be with us and with the Father and his Son, and that your joy might be full. So, then in verse 5 of chapter 1, we see this particular word. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him. So, in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, this is the message, we might say, he says, and then chapter 3, verse 11, he says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. And so it seems like there are two general themes that John uh, develops throughout this sermon, we might call it. And John doesn't, in this letter, proceed in a linear fashion as far as his arguments. Paul seems to be one that's very, like, you know, this and then this, which means this, but not this, therefore this. It's very linear, uh, if, we, if we might examine his arguments. John is more um, cyclical. He, he goes around and around and around. He hits a topic, and he comes back around to that topic, and then he comes back to it again, and he says some other things, and so that tells us more about this also, and it kind of grows and grows. So he's coming in and out and over and over again through two main themes, which we've kind of mentioned already. But the first one we see in verse 5 of chapter 1, this is the message which we, declare, which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, so God is light and he, he kind of comes in and out uh, uh, and around and everything that is associated with that to... Um, to believers. So God is light. Since God is light, we should be walking in the light. Um, and walking in the light means keeping his commandments, obeying him, um, ob obedience to um, God's commandment. And his commandments aren't grievous. His commandment is that we should love one another. And that is obeying his commandments is abiding in the light. We're to love one another. He has a message to uh, the different classes, we might say. There's um, older Christians and younger Christians and new believers and, and elders and concerning what they should know and what it, what it will take to overcome the wicked one. He reminds them in, uh, actually very strongly commands them in chapter 2, verse 15, not to love the world. Don't love the world. Um, he tells them about the rise of Antichrist. There's many Antichrists and um, how they deny Christ and, and turn away from Christ and that this is a sign of the last times. We don't have time to develop all of these things, but then we see an exhortation then to abide in the truth with the assurance that a divine anointing will give them all the needed instruction. And that unction is what we have in the scriptures. It's something that's been given to us by the Spirit of God. And that living in righteousness is a mark of the new birth. So this righteousness and um, the truth and light is a theme through chapters 1 and 2. And then I, know, I pointed out verse 11 of chapter 3. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Well, that, that we should love one another is coming down out of verse 1 of chapter 3 and following to the end of chapter 5. 
And in chapter 3, verse 1, it says what? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So the second theme that John rotates around, and he's kind of already talked about some and picks up uh, with more emphasis in these last three chapters, is that God is love. So in John we see God is light and God is love. His love is manifested in um, lifting us up, that we, that calling us his sons. And then we see that righteous living is the test of sonship. If we're believers, um, verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him, being a son, purifies himself even as he is pure. Um, so we have love distinguishes the mark of spiritual life. You know, something that we would get as we read through John is that, is, um, that our spiritual life is not, true spiritual life is not defined by um, certain things that we check off to make, that we make sure that we've done. Over and over again, we see that John says being spiritual means that you're loving, that you love God that you love your neighbor, that you love other believers. You say that you're a believer, you say that you love God, but you don't care for those that are around you. So, and, and that, that, those things, now we could take those things and make a list of them. Say, well, I've done that, and I've done that, and I've done that, and that would be absolutely the opposite of what John is saying to us. What we see is that, we have, that true believers have life in them. They have the light in them. They have the love of God in them, and it comes out. Uh, those that are trying to attain something don't necessarily have God's love in them. They're just trying to do this and that and that to salve their uh, personal ambitions and conscience. So, the out uh, love, so brotherly love is a distinguishing mark of a spiritual life, and love manifests itself in sacrifice. Um, not just in words, which we kind of mentioned. Um, the outcome of love is being a, having assurance and answered prayer. Um, brotherly love is essential to fellowship with God. We can say that we, we have fellowship with God, but if we don't love our brother, it's not happening. Um, divine love in our heart indicates that we've been regenerated, and it manifests in this itself in the sacrificial work of Christ. Um, chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begot loves him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we're going to be obedient when we have love, and this obedience gives us victory. Um, we have, there's divine witnesses to what God has done in the earth and in heaven, even the Spirit witnesses with our spirit. We have the gift of eternal life through Christ's Son and the certainty of answered prayer. And he even tells us in love how to deal with a sinful brother. Verse 16, If any man see a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. I will mention... Um, a couple years back, I worked my way preaching through 1 John, and that, uh, to me, is qu quite an interesting verse, and I don't have time to develop it, but if you look it, look it up, we should, should be on some place where we keep sermons. I know I preached it in chapel. Um, very helpful verse, I believe. Then, in verse 18, he says, We know that whosoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So he's saying all these things that we know um, what we can see basically from beginning to the end, um, for sure, is that, among other things, John sees Jesus Christ and God as one and inseparable. Not that um, there's only 
um, theologically that there's only one, but that the Father and the Son are both God, even though they have distinct, they're distinct persons. And his conclusion then is, it's an interesting uh, way to conclude, because he hasn't really mentioned this, I don't believe, through the whole book. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's like, whoa, where do the idols come from? Well, what is an idol? It's a recreation of God. It's, we, we, somebody thinks, um, I'm going to make, I, I, there's, there's got to be a God, so I'm going to make this thing a God. And whatever uh, figure they give to that thing, whether it's uh, in their mind or an actual inanimate object, that is become, that's what they think of God. Well, John spent the whole book and his whole gospel telling us who God actually is and that he's been here on earth, that we could see him, that we could handle him. And so we, it challenges us not to make other things up, not to, to put other things in the place that Christ should have in our lives and, of course, God. So, in this sermon, we might call it, um, indirectly or even directly addresses the issues of how to treat evangelists, how to treat people that are uh, going around and, and preaching the gospel, right? We're to, you know, this guy comes along and he says, oh, I love you, brother, but I can't, you can't stay in my house tonight. In fact, stay out of my church. You know, my name is um, Diatrophes. Um, or, and there's error coming around and we walk in the light, but here's somebody that's trying to sow seeds of darkness and we're, okay, you know, I know that you don't have it all straight, but, you know, the Lord bless you and keep you and, and prosper you in your way. You know, this, this first John is the, um, the truth and all the teaching that uh, the people needed in, for second John and third John, if John never got to see them face to face, we might say. All right, next week is Christmas Sunday, and then we will be looking at Revelation.